I think rather than delay uh, the start of the seminar, uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead and, and begin it. Um, my name, for those of you who don't know me, is Professor Joe Phoenix. Myself, uh, John Pike, who is one of our presenters, uh, Laura McGrath, who is ably um, monitoring all of the chat box, and Hannah Marston, who is also here with us, are four of the original Open University Gender Critical Research Network uh, members, founders, founder members, I think. Um, and this is, uh, to my great pleasure, uh, this is our first uh, session. Uh, John, did you want to say something? No, sorry. Okay. <laughs> yeah, this is our first seminar. Um, it isn't face to face. Sadly, you know, COVID is still out there, um, but we are in person at least um, and uh, a very topical subject as well, sex, gender and sport after Tokyo. Um, you will notice that the video and the uh, sound for all the attendees has been turned off. Uh, we've had to do this for a particular reason. Uh, John and myself and other members of the network have received numerous vexatious complaints about uh, supposedly being transphobic. Uh, and indeed, John and myself and the network have even had death threats made. So part of the uh, risk assessment that we had to do in order to have this event was to assess and figure out ways of controlling the risks that were presented to us by potential threats and disruption. So sadly, that means that we've turned the videos and the microphones off of the attendees so that we don't get disruption. Um, we want to keep the space open for academic freedom um, and for us to be able to talk about our work. So uh, that is um, the reason that you are muted. Uh, and thank you, Jovan. I just saw that, that comment. So thank you very much. That's fine. Um, Right, without further ado, uh, today's session is going to have John talking for 15 to 20 minutes, followed by Emma uh, talking for 15 minutes. Nope, the other way around. Other way around. Other way around. I beg your yeah. pardon. That's the one thing I didn't check. Emma first <laughs> for 15 minutes and then John for 15 to 20 minutes, which should leave us ample time at the end for uh, discussion and questions. Um, can you please put any questions you have or comments in the chat box? I will be monitoring the chat box as we go through and either interrupting the speakers with points of clarification or just getting the questions rallied for the discussion afterwards. Mm. OK, so without further ado, um, let me introduce you to uh, Dr. Emma Hilton of the University of from the University of Manchester. Emma, over to you. OK, thanks, Joe. Can everyone hear me? And can everyone see my screen? Yes. OK, great. So thanks for the invitation to talk with you today. We're going to talk about, as Joe said, sex, gender and sport after Tokyo. And um, I'm in this uh, field of research uh, because I'm a developmental biologist at the University of Manchester. And that means I have quite a key insight into males and females, what makes them different and what makes them different at sports. So I don't know how to, ah, there we go. So um, this topic, the idea of you know, what are sex segregated, sex segregated sports? Why do we have them? And how do transgender women fit into that kind of framework? Has been in the news very recently, but we've been watching this for several years now. Um, and I'll, I'll go through some of the events that have kind of thrust it into the, the public uh, domain. But, but basically today we're going to talk about a recent report from the Sports Council Equality Group, you might hear me call them SKEG throughout this. Um, so the Sports Council Equality Group are members from the five major UK sports councils. And a couple of weeks ago, they published updated guidance for transgender inclusion in domestic sport. And this is further to uh, guidance that I think they previously published in 2015 or so. And so I'd just like to reiterate um, a couple of the, the points of the report and talk about how my research kind of feeds into to, uh, their findings. Um, and, and then I'll hand over to John about how we move forward. 
So I'd just like to reiterate, and I'm sure it's the case for everyone here, that we want sport to be a place where everyone can be themselves, where everyone can take part, and where everyone is treated with kindness, dignity and respect. And so that's part of the report, and they're very upfront, that we need to find ways to be inclusive, um, but we also need to understand how that interacts with fairness. And so, of course, there's widespread support for ensuring that sport is a welcoming place for everyone. However, the report found, in summary, was that the inclusion of transgender people into female sports, we're talking about transgender women now, into female sport cannot be balanced regarding transgender inclusion. And that's a significant deviation from the kind of um, understanding that we've worked with to date, um, although John will argue differently, that, that there's this idea that we can somehow balance a little bit of inclusion, perhaps compromising some fairness or, or an argument that fairness isn't compromised at all. So this report was very clear. You cannot balance inclusion of transgender women in the female category with fairness and depending on the sport and um, the safety of female athletes. And, and that's concluded, or, or that conclusion was reached because they found, and I'll go through some of my own data on this, they, that was reached because there are retained differences in strength, stamina and physique between the average woman compared with the average transgen transgender woman. And so you will all know this because this is really quite basic knowledge, but um, almost all species reproduce by something we call sex. And in animals, that's every day. we see that as um, a sperm and an egg. And males make sperm, females make eggs, and they have different reproductive systems to um, help them do that. But of course, we don't play sports with our reproductive systems. Um, the key differences in sports are what we call secondary sex characteristics. So these are the differences that develop at puberty. Um, for males, they get this big surge of testosterone and it makes them um, broadly bigger and stronger than females. And there are lots and lots of metrics for how male and female physical anatomy in terms of their skeleton and their muscle are different. Things like uh, males are on average five inches taller than females. They have longer legs and arms, particularly uh, their upper legs and upper arms. They have broader shoulders and narrower hips, lower body fat. And, and what's going to become important, they have a far greater um, muscle mass. And so these physical differences between males and females that start at puberty obviously lead to functional differences. So we see that males are much stronger. They've got bigger muscle mass, so they're, they're stronger. Um, in, in all uh, measurements that we have, around 50% stronger through their quads. By the time you get to the, the upper body, we're looking at something like 90% um, increase in strength compared with females. And so this means, this greater strength means that they can move their arms faster, they can jump further, and um, they can punch much, much harder than females. And obviously those functional differences lead to performance differences in sport. And this is data, all of this in this table is data from a, a review that I published actually at the end of last year, but the citation was updated for this year. Um, all of these functional differences lead to performance differences in sport. And we see some performance gaps of around 10%, in, just slightly over 10% in swimming, rowing, track running, all the way through to really quite large differences in something like powerlifting, which is a, a clear strength sport to something like 65%. And so if you think about what that means in sport itself, rather than just a kind of graph of some metrics, what that means is that because this it, there's this 10 or 12% gap in running, it means that thousands of males are faster than the current 100 meter Olympic champion, Elaine thompson Hera. And the fact that these advantages are cemented at puberty means that the 15 year old schoolboy 100 meter record is faster than Flojo. She's the fastest woman who ever ran down the track. In terms of female swimmers, uh, Michael Phelps, the most perfect swimmer who, who ever got in the pool, as far as I can gather. Um, if you compare the extent of advantage he had over his second place competitor in the 2004 100 meter butterfly, um, he, was a, he was less than 1% by some measure, less than 1% ahead of second place. If you compare his performance, with the best female, he's nearly 13% faster than the, the closest female. And if we look at weightlifting as strength sport, um, if you, you track across different body weights, you'll find that males are, um, for, for the same weight and height, about 30% stronger 
than females. And in fact, really quite petite males, this is the 69 kilogram world record holder. Um, he, he actually lifts more than, than the strongest woman who has ever lifted in Olympic weightlifting. And she, she's 108 kilograms, by the way, he's 69. And so all of this means that we need sex segregated sports categories and that the SCEG report, these guidelines that came out a couple of weeks ago, affirm this. So again, a, a, a support for the inclusion of transgender people, but really that categorization within the sex binary is and remains the most useful and functional division relative to sporting performance. And that's down to all these, these kind of broad ranging and significant performance differences that really mean females wouldn't be able to win anything unless they had their own sex category. And so if we think about now how those gaps that exist between males and females in sports, how, how does that intersect with the inclusion or the proposed inclusion of transgender women. So um, when we talk about transgender women, we, we're understanding people who are born male and who've been through male puberty. And indeed, this was a cohort that I, along with um, Tommy Lumberg at the Karolinska, we studied how transgender women who had been through male puberty, but who have been suppressing testosterone, so suppressing this hormone that's given them, you know, this height and muscle mass advantage um, and had a look at whether we could see or, or get a handle on the magnitude of changes to their, their muscle and strength measurements um, before and after transition. So we measured to the length of the studies that were available, which was a maximum of three years. But we really focused on the one year boundary because that's the boundary um, that the International Olympic committee has decided is sufficient time to create fairness in the female sport and actually we published this um like i say late last year but pretty soon after there came a second systematic review of the same data set and, and we arrived at the same conclusion so i'll just take you through those very briefly the thing we were looking for was how how does how much muscle mass and how much strength do transgender women lose when they start suppressing testosterone for at least one year perhaps a bit longer and we found several studies that had various measurements of strength and um, mass including total lean body mass and when we kind of compiled all these you can see just on the left here we were able to find that broad the percentage loss in transgender women over this 12 months of suppressing testosterone and I should add these transgender women their testosterone levels were really very low well within to female range we see a broad kind of consensus that the loss of muscle mass is about five percent there are some very early studies where the, the the loss looked a little bigger this is actually over a three-year study but over the year we, we kind of see about a five percent loss in muscle mass or strength and what myself and Dr. Lumberg did was have a look at how that compared with as a percentage advantage that was retained over female mass and strength. And what we see really is that the losses that transgender women experience are really quite small compared with the retained advantage that those transgender women have over females in terms of things like grip strength, lean body mass and um, thigh volume. And so the assumption, if I, if I can put a little proposal here, the assumption, if we think about something like track sprinting, might be that this 10% performance gap might be explained by a 50% difference in leg muscle mass. I think that's quite a reasonable kind of thing to think about. If you want to create parity, if you want to close this performance gap, you're looking at a desired loss in muscle mass of around 25 to 30%. And in fact, if muscle mass is lost, with about five percent the performance gap is still really quite big so that was where we ended up that there is retained advantage when transgender women suppress testosterone and we concluded that the biological advantage most notably in terms of muscle mass and strength conferred by male puberty and thus enjoyed by most transgender women is only minimally reduced when testosterone is suppressed and the second review that I mentioned earlier by Joanna Harper came to a broadly similar, similar conclusion, which is that hormone therapy decreases strength, lean body mass and muscle area, yet values remain above that observed in cisgender women, even after 36 months. 
And there's some evidence of this male advantage that we're seeing in sports now. And so this is an event that happened in the Tokyo Olympics, and I think really got kind of fired up public interest in this. This is Laurel Hubbard. She's a, a transgender woman. She's a weightlifter. And she became the first transgender athlete to compete at an Olympic Games. And she's a weightlifter, and this is a this is a strength sport. And to understand her, how she's retained male advantage, you really need to look at how she performs compared to peers. Um, so first of all, she was the she became the oldest weightlifter in the female category in Olympic history. So she's very very old compared to the female weightlifters that she was competing against. And actually, you'd expect this to happen only one in some 300,000 athletes, for someone to be that old in the female category in weightlifting. And if you look at her age, she's, she's been weightlifting for the last five years. She took a 15 year career gap. In the last five years, she, she was weightlifting at master's ages, so late 30s, early 40s. And if you look at, this is just, don't worry too much about the details. This is the female 35 and 40 year old masters categories. These are typical of the types of lift that we see in, in this age group. Um, this is kind of a combined um, total lift here. This is typical of the males in the yellow here. And if you look at how Laurel Hubbard performs compared to age match peers, we see that she is very firmly lifting within the male range. That's compared to age match peers. And actually, her winning margins compared to females are massive. At the moment, she's 100% ahead of the best lifter in the 40-year-old female category. And, and that's in a, a weightlifting um, competition where typical margins in master's classes might be around 15%. And the odds of someone lifting this way in the female category are 1 in 2.8 billion. This is a once in a universe kind of event that a female would lift this. And if we correct for age, if we think, well, Laurel Hubbard is 43 now, we can kind of track back to what her performance would have been at 25 years old, because we've got very reliable kind of algorithms for how performance is lost over time in weightlifting. She would be the world record holder. She would, she would have won that Olympic uh, gold medal at Tokyo, and she would have smashed the world record. And so, like I say, Hubbard didn't win, and that that sounds like it's something a bit confounding in this whole uh, argument, but it's not. We have to account for her age. We have to account for how much further she is compared to females of the same age. And we have to allow for the fact that she competed five years after a 15-year break. This is unheard of in Olympic weightlifting. And that the evidence suggests she competed when she was unfit, when she was carrying a, a chronic injury, and it was clear that her, her game strategy was very poor. So we're left with two choices here. She's either statistically the best female, the best woman weightlifter who ever existed, or she's carrying male advantage. And I think the evidence that I've shown so far shows that it's likely to be the male advantage. And so with all that in mind, the, the SCEG report summarized that competitive fairness, so this fairness for female athletes in the female category cannot be reconciled with, with um, self-identification. So that's just simply entry into that category by gender identity only. That's absolutely impossible to consider as, as a fair situation. And that actually based upon current evidence like the, the kind that I've just showed you, testosterone suppression under the current guidelines for this 12 month requirement before entry, is unlikely to guarantee fairness between transgender women and females, particularly in sex affected sports. So they're the sports where, where strength and speed and stamina make a difference. And I think, yeah, I'll end there because I think what I've done there is really outline the problems that we've had with current policies and which I think SCAG have dealt with very well, I think they've summarised very nicely that you cannot balance inclusion and fairness. And, you, uh, you know, sports federations are really going to have to start wrestling with this. But this is now, um, I think, John's expertise. So I'll pass over here. Can I can I just come in for two seconds? Um, Emma, there is a comment uh, from Jess Evans, uh, one of our network members. Uh, 
stating that she gathers that the careers of female weightlifters are over by their late 20s. That is what you were saying more or less, wasn't it? Was it? So the average age in Olympic weightlifting is somewhere around 25. That's peak age for female weightlifters. Yeah. Um, we did see in Hubbard's category, um, Sarah Robles, who is 32, that already is quite a, a high yeah. end of the what we, okay. we would think of as typical age for an Olympic weightlifter. Laurel Hubbard was 43. OK, thank you. All right. So thank you, Emma. You can you can relax now if you like. Um, and it's my great uh, uh, my great pleasure to be able to introduce um, John Pike. He's a senior lecturer in philosophy at the Open University. He's also been consultant to uh, the World Rugby and uh, to the Sports Council um, and to the IOC. Uh, he is currently a PI on a project examining the eth ethic, I, blah, I knew I was gonna <laughs> tongue tie this one, examining the ethic of enhancement in competitive sports, which is IOC funded. Um, so John, over to you. Thanks, Joe. Um, there's quite a bit to say, and uh, so I'm just going to crack on. Firstly, with some words about the policy formation process here and then with some uh, bearing down on uh, digging down into some of the details of the SCEG report. Um, so first of all, um, to talk about, give a bit of a chronology um, of where this is going, starting with 2015. Um, I mean, these things go back further, but I want to isolate two key errors, I think, made in the IOC's approach to this which we've been trying to kind of unpick uh, really ever since. Those are the conflation of trans participation and DSDs, um, and that's very roughly the Casta Semenya case, cases like Casta Semenya, and the conflation of both of those with a single metric of testosterone levels. Both these conflations have been disastrous for working out um, policy in this area. Just to run through, after 2015, uh, research proceeds, this looks increasingly unsatisfactory, but there is now a policy void. That policy void is being filled up. Um, through the late 20 teens, the idea of IAAF has tried to resolve the issue of trans, uh, of Castor Semenya's inclusion by reference only to T levels that ended up um, at the Court of Arbitration in Sport. And without going into the details of that, both Semenya's position and in my view, World Athletics position were um, ethically untenable. Um, but we'll come back to that. Um, Emma and Tommy issued their pre-publication draft in 2020. Uh, as she's shown, uh, this shows that suppression leaves, T suppression leaves male advantage substantially intact. Now, in 2020, World Rugby, uh, in the absence of the IOC uh, formulating a satisfactory policy, moved in on this. Uh, there, they were driven, I think, primarily by concerns about the concussion crisis in rugby. They um, held a conference, both Emma and I were expert witnesses to that conference. And in uh, June, they issued guidance uh, that trans women may not play in the women's game at world rugby level, that is at international level, for reasons to do with both safety and fairness. Um, we move on to the Olympics this year. Laurel Hubbard, uh, who Emma has spoken about, qualifies in May on May the 30th, excluding uh, Raviel D'Amato. And uh, there is a widespread outcry about um, Hubbard's inclusion in the women's competition. It's worth whilst pointing out, of course, that this is her, her inclusion was within the guidelines, within the 2015 guidelines. Um, so that indicates the problem is not exactly with Laurel Hubbard, but with the guidelines. That's that's what our, our issue is with. Um, just before, four days before the uh, super heavyweight competition, the IOC admits that its guidelines are not fit for purpose. Um, 
Laurel Hubbard failed to record a lift. There's plenty that can be said about that, but I won't go into that. Um, and having said that their guidelines are not fit for purpose, the IOC Science and Medicine Commission fails to agree new rules, new guidelines, and postpones um, any new information until after the Winter Olympics. So what we've got now is guidelines that are not fit for purpose, but are still in place. Um, it's, it's a policy disaster. Uh, into this steps SCAG, and um, I want to talk about specifically the SCAG report. We may get in the future a statement from World Athletics, so other international governing bodies are stepping into the breach. But that's where we are on policy. The basic idea that I've been pushing in my in my writing on the ethics of sport is about the difficulties of, of uh, putting together safety, fairness and inclusion. Sport, I argue, is about bodies and we are a dimorphic species. We cannot change sex. Our sexed bodies matter for the categorization of sport into male and female competition. And this is justified, as Emma's shown, by the very wide ranging and profound physiological differences and advantages that are held by men. Um, sorry, I should say I will circulate this presentation as um, as a handout, so there's no need to try and write all this down. Um, so let me sorry, let me move on. Um, and here is the SCEG, the outcome of the conclusion of the SCEG report, which Emma has already shown you. SCEG concludes that these these uh, inclusion, safety and fairness cannot be balanced. So I want to say a bit about balancing and their solution. So here's a bit of philosophical jargon for you. If things are not possible together, philosophers say they are not compossible. So in specific circumstances for what are called gender affected sports, safety, fairness and inclusion are not compossible, are not possible together. That's what Skeggs concluded, and that is, if you like, a philosophical conclusion. Um, I should say it's pretty widely acknowledged that the term gender affected sports is an error. What we're really talking about is sex affected sports, and um, it's this is an error introduced in the Equality Act of 2010. The distinction between sex and um, um, gender is obviously critical in this area and um, we need to be specific about the terms that we use they're not gender affected sports on the understanding on the kind of contemporary understanding of, of gender they're sex affected okay so how do we resolve this problem of the lack of compossibility to get a solution that is maximally safe maximally fair and maximally inclusive in the SCEG guidance, when I saw page 12, my jaw uh, dropped because this option up here, the female and open category, is what I've been banging on with other people for the last two or three years. And when you see your uh, philosophy in a, um, in a public policy paper, it's a bit of an awesome experience. Um, but what Skeg have said, uh, sorry, I don't want to make say that I'm the only person who's argued for this, fair play for women have argued for this. Uh, Julie Bindle, I think, has suggested this sort of solution and some other philosophers of sport. But here we go, female and open category. This box here, the create additional versions, a sort of model of this is the idea of touch rugby. I'm not convinced that touch rugby is, in fact, a universal solution, uh, but that's, if you like, a, a, a practical and technical problem. The idea is that you create a non-collision version of rugby in which it is safe for uh, male bodied athletes and female bodied athletes to compete. Now, that's one for the rugby specialists and the sports scientists, but it's the sort of idea that SCEG are getting at. Um, this is the option that is pursued at the moment by the IOC. Uh, it is to prioritise transgender inclusion. And what Skeg point out is that this is neither fair nor safe for female athletes. And this is our preferred category. So I'll say a little bit more about the ethics of this. 
there are a number of different ways in which you can justify the uh, female slash open uh, solution. I want to pick up two philosophical ideas here. One is the idea of reasonable rejection, what principles can be reasonably rejected, and the other is the distinction between pre-institution and institutional fairness. Uh, two versions of fairness. So moving from uh, Tim Scanlon, uh, I take I'm working with this contractualist account um, and asking what sort of reasons can be given for rejecting a, a policy proposal here. Can a principle be reasonably rejected? Because of course we're discussing principles governing categorization in sport, uh, which is a version of the question, what would be the consequence of the general acceptance of these principles, of this, gen, uh, uh, of this principle? So for example, Scanlon says, people have strong reasons to want to avoid bodily injury and to have control over what happens to their bodies. OK, so it follows that a first reasonable rejection is this. Female bodied athletes can reasonably reject principles that threaten their bodily integrity by increasing the risk of serious or life changing injury. And in the case of world rugby, this is pretty much all that was needed to argue for uh, the policy they came up with. Um, uh, so that first reasonable rejection refers to bodily integrity. Here is what I argue is the second reasonable rejection. Female bodied athletes can reasonably reject principles that make their sport, female sport, unfair. So what do we mean here by fairness? Fairness is derived, I'm going to argue, institutionally or socially from the category of women's sport. That's to say, if we have a category of women's sport, we have it because um, the, sorry, if we have a category of women's sport, we have it because and in order to eliminate male advantage. Now, sorry, I'm just turning off the chat for myself because it's getting too distracting, sorry. The category, of female sport is justified by a pre-institutional fact, the fact that we're a dimorphic species. So you could look at all the uh, data that Emma presents and say, well, you know, those are just differences between uh, males and females, um, unless we have, unless we get to the second step that we have a category of female sports, justified it by those differences, we've got no account of fairness. So what I'm suggesting here is it's a two step uh, move from the facts of female and male disparities to the institution or the category of women's sport. And it's from the category of women's sport that we understand the um, we understand the nature of fairness. You can't just read off fairness, that is to say, from from the brute facts of uh, dimorphism. Dimorphism justifies the category. The category then justifies our, our, our understanding of fairness. But there isn't a third step, this is quite important, there isn't a third step that says, given that we have the women's category, who is permitted to compete in it? Because the answer is given by the understanding of the category. The understanding of the category is the exclusion of male advantage. So if we have a women's category to allow women the opportunity for fair sporting success in the absence of male advantage, then it is unfair for those with male advantage to compete in that class. What's happened here, I think, is a massive misunderstanding of the nature of sporting fairness, but that's up for um, discussion in the, in the Q&A. Here's the third and I think important reasonable rejection though. Trans athletes, I think, can reasonably reject principles that require them to gender identify in a way that they feel to be inappropriate or harmful or incongruent. This stems from an argument from reasonable alternatives. 
What I mean by this is that a principle can be rejected if there's an alternative principle available uh, which eliminates a harm and does not reduce any good. So inappropriate gender, ident gender identification from sport, and that's the point of the female open categorization. We do, however, require sex identification of female bodied athletes in order to make the sex category of female a fair one. So here we are. This is the rough understanding of contemporary sport that we have two classes, women and men. It's not strictly accurate in some cases because some cases the regulations are slightly different. Um, and uh, in some cases, Emma tells me the NBA and some, uh, I think the AFL are in fact uh, have open categories. Um, but uh, the, the common, if you like, the folk understanding is that we have two different classes. Now, the innovative change that um, Skeg has uh, proposed is this, that we have two new classes, female recorded at birth and open. So the division of sport ought to be ref reflect and be written around bodies. It ought to recognize male advantage and protect women's sport from those with uh, male advantage. There should therefore be a protected female category of sport, and this excludes everyone with male advantage. It is, of course, optional whether those who lack male advantage compete in this category but they're welcome to do so. For this, this might be, for example, socially trans transitioning trans men who are open to compete in the open category. And of course, gender identifiers as, as, as men. Um, uh, this category, and of course, trans women, are, it's open to them to gender identify as women. Uh, and the open category is open to trans women. It's not a gender defined category. It's not even a sex defined category. So instituting these categories would be maximally inclusive. It would enable everyone who is currently able to compete to compete in a category that provides them access to fair sport. So the female and open category does not uh, distinction, does not threaten the bodily integrity of female athletes. It does not threaten the female, uh, the fairness of sport. It does not require that trans athletes identify in a way they regard as inappropriate or harmful. So what's the um, what's the drawback? Well, of course, I don't want to kind of avoid the um, the objection. Uh, the concession is that it does fail to validate the gender identity of some trans athletes. That is to say, it fails to validate the identity of uh, some trans athletes who identify as women. Uh, it does not violate those gender identities because it doesn't require them. It doesn't require um, uh, require announcement, if you like, of gender identity. Um, and moreover, I think that the requirement that gender identities are validated is not reasonable because gender identity is strictly irrelevant to sport categories in the same way that my sexual orientation or my political beliefs would be irrelevant to sports categories. So here are some general, sorry, I should pause there. That's the end of the sport bit, right? Here's some general conclusions about, if you like, gender criticality. Um, what I've tried to do is kind of suggest that there's a um, a case study here that sex bodies matter in this particular context of sport. Right, sex bodies matter. They, if you like, trump gender identity. They are, if you like, philosophical and clever ways we can think around social policy in this context. We've got to try and resolve the puzzle in these contexts. Um, there are other contexts. So gender, sex sensitive sport is one, physical vulnerability, uh, nakedness, unconsciousness, physical confinement. So healthcare, hospitals, uh, dormitories, prisons are a similar context. Uh, 
vulnerability towards sex, uh, sexual violence is critical. Uh, context of social or uh, sexual orientation and intimacy uh, for all of for all people who um, have, as it were, uh, uh, an orientation to sex bodies um, and sexual health and access to sexual health and others. So gender criticality, if you like, as a as a form of uh, theoretical approach just says look at these contexts in which sex bodies matters and let's do some public policy here. Um, I'll leave it at that. Uh, thank you and I'll stop presenting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've had a few questions and comments uh, in the chat box um, and I'll throw uh, a couple at you if that's all right. Um, I'll just kind of slowly speak so that you can gather your thoughts and also John so that you can take a glass of water because <laughs> speaking is always dry work. Um, there was a, a bit of a beginning of a discussion about pronoun usage um, and and I think you know that that sits outside of our remit today um, but there is I think an issue that was raised by some of the commentators in the in the chat box about how we speak about these different categories of people. I mean, um, and I'll just abuse my position as chair here for a second. Even in the things that I write, trying to distinguish between individuals with a GRC, individuals without a GRC, natal female, natal men, we get into these tangled knots just literally in trying to define and, and talk about this. So that's really just an open statement. Um, John, Emma, how do you resolve some of the, the the grammatical and stylistic challenges that we are presented with in describing our worlds of work here? Um, I stick to open university policy, first of all. <laughs> the second thing is that it's an enormously tricky problem, um, I think, and I just want to flag up a minimal point. In this area, it is absolutely essential that in order to discuss the ethical problem, we distinguish between gender identity and sexed bodies. Um, if you can't do that, um, and some of the very restrictive guidelines sent around by Stonewall and others suggest that you can't do that, you can't even get going with the discussion in this area. Now, either there is no ethical issue about sport because trans women are women and self ID is not only a policy option, but if you like the metaphysical option, the only way of understanding the world. And you make the um, uh, the, 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 the the ethical issue disappear in a puff of logic. Mm. Right. Either that's the case, in which case, you know, I'm out of a job and all those interested in kind of uh, categorizations of, of sex in the world in any way are out of a job. That can't be right. Or we need to find a way of discussing this. We need words. We need we need a language. Um, which particular language, you know, which particular words and terms you use is, of course, subject to a great deal of sensitivity. But, um, you know, I I tend to talk about sex, uh, male bodied athletes and female bodied athletes, gender identity and sex. And, OK, yeah, thank you. Thank you, John. Emma, do you want to add anything? And um, just to say this is I come at this from a slightly different angle, and that's because I'm a developmental biologist and the majority of females that I spend my time around are not human females, they are <laughs> animal females. And so, it's, so the word woman to me is not something I really ever use in academic speech. You know, when I've, you know, over my career, I've never really had to even think about this. I talk about females, females. And I know some people don't like that because it sounds like breeding stock, but that essentially is what the word describes. So it's always been very easy for me to talk about females and males as nouns. And that's something that I do have for my own personal um, point of view, and one that I would argue academically, that's something uh, that's a line I hold very strictly. 
Okay. Um, but there, there is, there are pragmatic considerations, and a wry nod also to the University of Manchester policy, and and the way that if we are trying to kind of raise policy issues and have meetings with people like World Athletics and that kind of thing, that at some point there is a, a level where we have to, you know, be at that table and publish these papers, and we're probably not going to get there with language that you know is viewed as needlessly provocative so i do use um she her pronouns and i know that some you know i get criticism for that but that's a that's a position that i've taken to okay thank you thank you very much um we'll leave pronouns there for the moment because ultimately that becomes a question of politics um once we get past the moment that we as academics define our terms of reference. Uh, so we'll just, we'll park that set of discussions. There was a question previously uh, at one point, I think it was just as you were talking, Emma, about, or just as you stopped, about the 12 months policy. Um, can you say anything about where that came from? Um, no, because when I've tracked the IOC history, I, it doesn't seem to be, uh, rationalized using any science and I spent a lot of time looking at I mean there aren't too many meeting meeting minutes available or, or that kind of thing it feels like someone just said look that feels about right mm. and that's as much as I can say because they're really they didn't use any science to justify this policy okay that's I think I think that actually drives the point home on, that's sitting under the question there isn't science that sits underneath that policy it's a kind of mm, yeah feels about right um Okay, yeah, it's incredible how many policies are resolved in that fashion <laughs> across a whole set of domains. Um, another question came up uh, about whether or not, perhaps as we move forward, we, we need to not just think about a one solution fits all sports, but actually introduce solutions that are sport uh, sensitive, if you like. Um, I think I've interpreted the, the, that statement correctly. So, uh, Emma, John, is there something that you'd like to say about that? I think that's probably more towards John. Um, do we need a one solution fits all or can we actually have something more well, nuanced? Look, look, Skegg's solution is a three solutions fits all, really. Um, now, I think one of those solutions is uh, deeply problematic, um, but uh, broadly speaking, if a sport is um, sex affected, then you can't achieve the universalist, the unisex outcome unless you can do something very clever. Right. The idea of the very clever thing is something like touch rugby. And I said, I'm not sure if touch rugby works, but something along those lines. Um, um, and then there are questions about equestrianism, uh, shooting, motorsport that maybe are not sex affected sports. Uh, so there is a small number of sports in which, you know, which are in that category. And there's been some debate, interesting debate on Twitter about sailing, whether sailing falls into that category and maybe it doesn't. There's some quite technical and interesting uh, uh, discussions there. Um, but in general, for uh, I think the, the idea that you can have a sport by sport approach covers up an ambiguity between two things. One is the idea that some sports are sex, sex affected and the others, others aren't, which I agree with. And the, uh, the, the other ambiguity is that it's down to governing bodies to uh, decide what their priorities are. And politically, I think that's true. But in terms of the ethics of sport, I think that's a mistake because I think straightforwardly, for example, Kickboxing UK have just got it wrong. They have said, despite the fact that it is unfair and unsafe for women to compete against trans women in kickboxing, we're going to go for that. And I think that's straightforwardly wrong. And if that's what sport by sport means, then I'm again it. Okay. Um, there's a, there's a, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, there's a question that's come up. Uh, Jim Turner has asked, um, well, he stated, apologies if I missed this, John, but how would your female recorded at birth category handle trans men who gain some male advantage from testosterone treatment? Yeah. Would it force them into an open category? And what would the cutoff be? Good. 
Um, yes. Um, the, the, right. So there are in, in this framework, there are kind of details that need still to be worked out. One is testosterone, TUEs and trans men. The other is DSDs. Um, and people need to do the work here carefully. So my answer to Jim is more or less the answer that Skeg has come up with, which is that uh, testosterone use without a therapeutic use exemption is a doping infraction. Um, testosterone use with a TUE um, is allowable, but I think it's important that if uh, trans men use testosterone, they are then uh, they should then play in the um, in the open category. Um, and the regulations for TUEs is actually something I worked on with WADA. Um, and there are inc there is a more liberal approach introduced in the 2021 WADA um, anti-doping code um, that allows for testosterone use if it is manifestly not unfair um, for athletes to, to use testosterone. And I think that it will apply to uh, uh, trans men because it's manifestly not unfair for trans men on testosterone to compete in the open category because it doesn't make up for the other disadvantages that arise from the absence of male androgenization, i.e. the absence of male puberty. So sorry, that's a bit of a complicated answer, um, but and the details are there. But in general, the MAC, um, what's the name, the, the case of the trans man who was forced to wrestle against uh, uh, non-trans female wrestlers in the States, I think shows that there is a big problem with allowing trans men on testosterone to compete against women, female, female yeah. bodied athletes. Thank you. Emma, do you want to add anything? No. OK, um, I've been trying to keep up with what's going on <laughs> in the chat box. So um, if I haven't asked your question and you've posted it in there, can you please <laughs> repost it um, because it, it was scrolling up quite a bit um, and as we're just looking through Ian McNee on John's point about individual sporting bodies quote getting it wrong is the only possible way around that the IOC getting it only possible way around that the IOC getting it right i.e. is that likely influential enforceable does that um, make sense John. Yeah, sure. So what I think, right, uh, I think the SCEG guidelines are great, but I think there's a there's an issue with them and a problem with them that there is this loophole for for people like what we what we know UK kickboxing to say, yeah, we're going to be unsafe and unfair. Right now, what happens for them, for their insurers? What happens down the road? I don't I don't know. Um, but if you like, I think that it's 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 arguable that certainly in combat sports, that's just um, kind of a concession too far by by Skeg. And in my uh, in my written uh, response, I've tried to make that point. Um, what I think will ha look long term, I think there's a reason that the IOC are um, prevaricating on this, and that's that they they don't know what to do and they're in a terrible mess. The fact that the SCEG report and the World Rugby report before them have advanced a solution that I think is ethical, that is round, grounded in science, um, that secures fair sport, will not go unnoticed. Um, I don't think policy making at the IOC is particularly open uh, or transparent, but I think they must be coming under pressure. And I hope that pressure continues. Uh, we'll see. I mean, I, I don't know. So watch this space. Right, we have time for one more question, um, and this comes from Anya. It's a repost, so thank you, Anya, for doing that. Uh, would it be acceptable to accept uh, men, brackets males, in women's sports if we can prove that, for instance, 10 years testosterone su suppression is sufficient to mitigate advantage? Would the aim of mitigation not leave us with mediocre slash disadvantaged males versus elite women. 
So this is, is perhaps a, a question to start with with Emma. What happens if we actually didn't say 12 months, but 10 years? Um, where would that take us? 